Thanks for checking out this video. This is about why are movie remakes and sequels so popular. And this is, is mainly from the standpoint of, you know, why I believe studios do a lot of remakes and sequels. But it's also ac applicable to the popularity amongst audiences as well. This is actually something I was just kind of thinking about this morning. Um, it's something that people complain about and go crazy about in a good way um, as far as film audience goes. So... First off, uh, just a little bit of disclaimer, if I sound a little bit congested and, and I have to like stop and, you know, like take a, take a deep gulp of um, saliva every now and then, it's because it is allergy season and damn allergies, they're so bad. So anyway, <laughs> um, I don't want to take up all my time with that stuff. So why are remakes and sequels so popular? So I have a few notes so I'm going to be looking down at my phone because I have a few notes put down because I want to make sure I hit all the main points that I was coming up with here now disclaimer on this it is not you know I'm not a professional I'm not in the film industry um, I, w I didn't do research for this either these are all things that I sat down and critically th was thinking about I do know a lot about film I've worked on film I don't want to say I've worked in film I've worked on film because I've done like you know, independent stuff, um, nothing with any studios or anything like that. But I have a lot of experience with film. I've take some, taken some courses having to do with film and stuff like that. So at any rate, it, total disclaimers is my opinion. So take it for what it's worth. Um, so one of, the, one of the main things about making remakes and sequels is that there's a built-in fan base. It makes sense for studios because... They already know that they're going to be able to bring people to the film. There's a, there's always a segment of the potential audience who is going to be down to see that just because it has to do with material they're familiar with and have liked before, most likely. Uh, the other thing with that is because of that, it means they have to do less marketing. Think about it from the standpoint of something that's totally new. Um you know, think about like Get Out, you know, when I'm always going to think about it from a horror perspective, by the way, because that's kind of how I'm geared. But think about it from the perspective of, of a movie like Get Out. They kind of didn't, they had to do a lot more marketing for that film just because it was so brand new. People didn't know what they were going to be getting into. It was a uh, new director, new material. Although people knew Jordan Peele, they didn't know him for doing horror. So there was a lot more marketing that needed to go into that. Um, it was also a very unsure thing um, with with doing the the sequels and the reboots. They, <clears throat> excuse me, they basically know that it, that material has been tested before and it worked well. So all they need to do is build off of that and you know continue, and they can have something successful. So less marketing needed. That's a big point. So that means spending less of this, which you know. Studios are always looking to do that. Companies in general are always looking to do that, spend less. Um, they're going to sell tickets on familiarity alone, at least some. And honestly, this is really all that matters for theatrical releases. So I know there are like sequels and reboots that are like straight to DVD, straight to Blu-ray, uh, straight to streaming services even. You know, if you think about Shudder having, doing like the Critters and New Binge or uh, Puppet Master, Littlest Reich, you know, things like that. Um, but for theatrical release, you know you're going to sell tickets immediately based off of people's familiarity with the properties. So think about things like the Saw films. You know, <clears throat> granted, they, they kept going with those. There wasn't a huge time gap between doing the first one or first and second one and then doing others. It, they kept it going, but each time they put out one of those movies, they knew they were going to sell tickets because there are people who are like, well, I like Saw. I like the Saw franchise. So even though it was diminishing returns for the film and people kept complaining, you kept having these people coming back and coming back and coming back because they wanted to know where they were going to take the story next because it was one gigantic story. You know, now, not all you know reboots and remakes, um, sequels are like that, but... That's just one example of how they keep the ticket sales going assured for doing these types of films. So that's another thing to kind of think about with it. Studios already own some of these properties. That's another thing. They don't have to go out and look for new stuff in these instances. They don't have to go out and spend extra money. They already own the property. 
They can go to a writer, to a director who they're already very familiar with, may already have contracts with, and say, hey, write this up, direct this, let's get this going. So there, yet again, is another time time saver and mainly money saver because obviously it's all about money when it comes to these studios. Every now and then they will take chances on some other type films that they know may not be as successful, but a lot of times that ends up coming in where they've been working with a writer and or director who they really trust and they kind of make a deal with them up front and say, if you do these movies for us that we know will make money and these are our cash cows, then we will allow you to do something more creative for yourself. I know that, um, you know, like the big names get that kind of stuff. Like people like a Spielberg will get that kind of freedom. People like way back Stanley Kubrick got that kind of stuff. Someone like Quentin Tarantino is another one. Once directors kind of reach that certain status, it's kind of like, we trust you. But then there are also these moments where they're like, we need a certain thing out of you and then go ahead and do what you want. So there's that going on. Uh, they already own the properties, just to reiterate. Um, it's riskier to brand new material, to put new material out there. Like I was kind of saying about, you know, how they had to market a lot more for, for the film to get out. You have to get people in those seats. If they're not already familiar with characters, they're not already familiar with the title, with the story, whatever, you have to generate interest yourself as a studio. So there's a lot more marketing that ends up going into that. And you have to sell it. Like, it, it's a much bigger, it's a much harder sell. And there have been a lot of films that have come out in theaters or gone straight, straight to Blu-ray, DVD, streaming services, whatever, that, you know, there were lofty hopes for. And it just did not pan out. I um, Just thinking off the top of my head, one that had come out kind of recently that I thought looked kind of interesting concept-wise, but I did not go see it, and apparently a lot of other people didn't, was that Mortal Engines uh, film. I know they had high hopes for that film because it looks like they put a lot of money into it, but it bombed in the box office. And that's another instance of, you know, if that studio, if you go to that studio and you kind of say, all right, what do you want to do? Do you want to do this Mortal Engines thing that's new and it may be a little bit tough to sell? Or are you, do you want to do another, like something like Harry Potter? Do you want another Harry Potter property? I think if you give them that that option, they'd be like, well, we'll take another Harry Potter because we know we're going to make money on that one. It's a sure thing. Although, when I use Mortal Engines as, a, um, as an example, I think that's based off some books, so it's not entirely brand new because uh, that's that's kind of another aspect of this stuff is films based on, on books and comic books honestly, because those also have built-in fan bases and will already sell tickets based off of people who have read the books, people who have read the comics, stuff like that. So in a sense, those types of films fit into this kind of remake, reboot realm as well. I mean, look at the Marvel movies. I mean, they're very well done. They're very well written, directed, all that. But the reason the these particular characters get people into theater seats initially is because they know them from the comics. So, but now at this point, it's just kind of, people just know, like, if it's a Marvel film, they're going to want to see it just because Marvel's done a good job. So they've kind of built their own um, reputation. Um, another aspect of, of doing these types of films, there's already story to work off of. There's it's it's much easier for the writer for the director to know what they're going to do with a film uh, that's that's a sequel or a reboot because it's already been done the story's already been laid out the characters have been laid out the environment the world for the story has already been created so you know your parameters you know where you're working and it kind of gives you more focus as opposed to when people have to approach a script that's totally blank make up all your own characters make up your own environment, make up your own rules within the world you're creating and come up with a really good storyline. It's much harder, way harder. And I know because I've, I've written scripts before, none of them have, I mean, they've been made like independently, like short films. Um, but I mean, I have some feature length scripts. Nothing's ever, most likely ever going to happen with that type of stuff. There's so many people out there who write scripts and it goes nowhere, but I do it for myself pretty much. It's a good time. Um, 
sometimes you can get original talent for less money. That's another thing, especially with a lot of these sequels, sometimes with, with remakes, but there will be people, especially when there's a lot of time that, that has passed, you know, some decades since another one of those films has been done, and you can get the same people who were in, who were in the original who may not have been working really much at all since then for less money. It's another money thing. You know, you don't have to go out necessarily and get big talent because you'll be able to draw people in with the originals. One of the big things that people have complained about a lot in the horror community is the fact that Brad Dorif is not going to be voicing uh, Chucky from Child's Play anymore. So obviously, Brad Dorif is a big draw for people who love the Child's Play films. And I know they're doing a series now, and they have cast... Um, Mark Hamill, actually, as the person who's going to be doing the voice of Chucky, which I think is a really good fit. But you have all these people, and I understand it, who are like, no, it's got to be Brad Dorif. He's still available. He could still do this because he's been the voice. And there are just there's just always a segment who doesn't want change with these things. They love these films. They want to see the next one. They want it to keep going. But they want the familiarity of the people involved with it, too. And a lot of times you can get those individuals for less money. I guess I can't say a lot of times. Sometimes is what I'll say. Um, audience is usually more forgiving with the material. Um, this especially applies with horror films. Because people have such a, um, such a close tie to these properties they already really like them they're going into it with the aspect with the um the mindset that i want to like this i really want to like this instead of going into it with a blank slate or saying you know i'm a little, a little bit skeptical of this one although you do get that a little bit if people have seen the trailer ahead of time and they're like this doesn't look a whole lot like the ones that i'm used to and really like so you do get that too but for the most part, I think people go into it with a positive attitude saying, I want to like this. So people are naturally going to look for a way to enjoy the film. So for that reason, it's a good bet for, for studios to do because these audience members are going to want to like it. And that's obviously good for the studios. Um, and they're also just more forgiving in that instance. If they have a story that just doesn't fully pan out, some people will just be like, well, you know, okay, but they got X, Y, and Z right about the other, f you know, in common with the other films, so I'm good. Or they got X, Y, and Z right from the original film because it's a remake, so I'm all right with that. Um, prime example of kind of like with me, I did a review for the puppet master littlest reich that was on shutter and when i watched it i was like you know the story's not like great but it's okay and my main thing of what i liked about it was it had the puppets and it gave the puppets a lot of screen time and there were a lot of kills involving the puppets so that's the perfect example like i'm the perfect example of this in in that instance of you know, I'm familiar with Puppet Master. I like the Puppet Master movies, even though a lot of people would say they're not actually, like, good. They're just kind of, like, fun. Um, and because I like that stuff, because I have a good feeling about those films, I like that film. You know, if I never heard about Puppet Master before, um, never seen anything, had no tie to it whatsoever, if I went into watching that, that uh, Littlest Reich, would I have liked it? Probably not as much. I mean, I can pretty much guarantee I wouldn't have liked it as much. So there is that at play. It's it's much more forgiving for the segment of audience who already knows the property going into it. So um, the other thing is this plays to nostalgia. It really does. Um, and I think that's why you end up seeing a lot of reboots. Uh, the big thing is people, to use kind of an old, an old adage, uh, people view it through rose-colored glasses. You know, the, when they have a tie from their childhood to a particular film or series of films, they just are always going to have fond memories. It always just triggers you as, ah, yeah, you know, I remember watching that when I was a kid. And a lot of times, if you go back and watch these films, 
in adulthood, it's not as great as you think. Uh, prime example, when I was in high school, I went to the theater and saw the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe and Joaquin Phoenix. I loved it. I thought it was amazing. Um, it was like 10 years later or so. I watched it again, and I was just like, what did I see in this? Why did I like this so much? But I remember loving it so much and then watching it as I'm older and have matured a lot more. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't, I don't like this film. This film actually sucks. So, I mean, the visuals were still good and the fight scenes, but yeah. So it's just that whole thing of, you know, the connection you initially made with that material and it comes into play. So that's just one more aspect of driving people to get their butts in the seats at theaters to see them or buying Blu-ray, DVD, or watching it on a streaming service, whatever. So, yeah. So anyway, that's it. The, those are all my, my points I wanted to uh, hit on this. And to reiterate, this is a disclaimer. This is just my opinion. These are just my feelings on why there is a popularity amongst studios mainly of doing remakes and um, sequels to, to other stuff. So, <clears throat> that said, what I want is to hear is to, well, here to read your comments down below and see what what are your thoughts can you think of any things that i didn't think of that should definitely definitely be included in this conversation um and let's just have like a back and forth let's let's see like what did you think i was wrong about what did you think i was right about give me some examples from your life that might fit some of the stuff that i put or contradict what i was talking about we can do that too the other thing is you can give me some thumbs up it doesn't really matter that much, but what does matter, what really matters is that subscription. If you can just take literally one second, hit that subscribe, hit the notification bell, because the notification bell will let you know as soon as I have put up another video, and then you can go and watch it. And when people watch videos close to as soon as they go up, it really helps with the success of them. You can look back through my um, through all my video library on, on this channel, and you can see that there are similar videos, mainly for my unboxings, where one month they do awesome, another month they do terrible, basically. And I'm talking about huge, huge, huge difference in the amount of views with it. And it has a lot to do with you, viewers, who jump on as soon as you see it versus you know saying, oh, I'll get to it sometime later. So subscription, notification bell, and you're awesome. And then you can talk about that down down here. You can just be like, hey, I just subscribed. And guess what? I'll be like, you're awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> also, are there any particular topics you guys want me to talk about? I'm mainly looking for kind of horror related. But if it's not horror, that's that's okay. I'll go with film in general. But also like pop culture is fine. I, you know, I'm kind of open. If there's something you want to hear about that you think I might have a decent opinion on, go ahead, put it down in the comments, and I'll see what I can do. But anyway, thanks everyone for checking this out. I appreciate it. And until next time, keep it brutal.